we continue to chart the downfall of Anne Boleyn, looking at events which happened between the 11th and the 17th of May. So we continue to track the day-by-day -day events in the downfall of Anne Boleyn. We began two weeks ago on the 29th of April when she had an argument with Henry Norris, who um, Henry Norris was the chief gentleman of the Privy Chamber of Henry VIII, one of Henry VIII's best friends, and they actually had an argument. You'll have to watch the previous episode, the two weeks back, uh, to find out about that. But that's where it began. Um, and Weirdly, we'll talk about this in a bit, but that was never uh, mentioned again. Uh, you have to go back and watch it. Uh, and we've tracked day by day what has happened. So up till now, we have Anne in the tower and we have seven uh, other men in the tower as well who have all been charged with um, or accused of adultery with the Queen and of plotting the King's death. We're looking, first of all, at the 11th of May and the Kent indictment. The previous day, we'd had the Middlesex indictment. So we had two uh, juries who basically had to sit uh, to decide whether there was enough evidence for it to go to trial. And so this is where all of the charges were read out. And the reason we have two indictments is because of the areas that were covered by these alleged incidents, as in physical locations. So the Middlesex indictment had listened to the charges um, that were supposed to, the alleged offences that were supposed to have taken place at um, Whitehall and Hampton Court Palace. The Kent indictment on the 11th of May heard effectively exactly the same charges, except they were supposed to have taken place at Greenwich Palace and Elton Palace. Which, were, which came under the Kent area. Middlesex covered the other areas, so the day before. But they're effectively the same uh, charges. And again, you can listen back to hear what they were uh, on the 10th. But effectively, they were designed to shock. They were designed to disgust. Um, and as I have argued previously, also they were also fairly obvious that regardless of whether people truly believed them or not, there was something else afoot here. Anne was accused of basically being, in, being insatiable, having um, a sexual appetite that really couldn't be uh, satisfied by multiple men, apparently including her own brother, George um, Lord Rochford. And these men, many of them were close to the king, um, Many of them were in, all by one, were in Anne's inner circle. And the language was used to shock, not only with the jury and the people in the court here, what had been said, but of course that would then disseminate out into the general population. And so as with the day before in Middlesex, the Kent indictment, the Kent jury, found that there was enough evidence to send the men to trial. Now, as I briefly mentioned before, the argument that Anne had had with Norris on the 29th of April actually could have been something that she could have been made to answer for. She talked about how he looked to walk in dead man's shoes. And yet that didn't appear in either indictment, which raises the question whether these charges had been thought up at a much earlier date. Five men were to be tried as well as Anne. Four of them were tried at Westminster Hall on the 12th of May. Mark Smeaton, Sir Henry Norris, Sir William Brereton and Sir Francis Weston were all tried at Westminster Hall. Um, the West, that's actually the hall that still exists at the House of Parliament or Westminster Palace of Westminster. Um, you can go and see the Great Hall uh, and it's well worth going to look. But that is where the jury tried them and they were being tried for high treason. Now the men were not in a good position. This was not going to be a fair trial by any standards. Not only was the jury a hostile one, but the men were not even party to what the evidence or the charges were going to be against them before they stood. It was really a case of being able to prove they were innocent 
as opposed to uh, a prosecution having to prove guilt. Even though Norris, Weston and Brereton had pleaded not guilty, all four, including Smeaton, who had originally confessed, um, possibly under torture, we don't know, to having sexual relations with the Queen, all four men were found guilty of high treason, their estates, property confiscated, and they were sentenced to execution at Tyburn. Now this still left the trial of Anne herself and her brother George to be conducted. As members of the higher aristocracy, they were entitled to be uh, judged only by a jury of their own peers. And that was going to be quite close to home. On the same day of the trial of the other four men, Anne and George's uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, was appointed Lord High Steward of England in readiness for their trials. On the 13th of May, two days before Anne's trial, Anne's household was broken up. Now this could only have been done on the King's orders, so he was obviously very confident at this point that Anne was going to be condemned. On the 14th of May, on the orders of Henry VIII, Jane Seymour was installed in her own house in Chelsea. Already she was dressed the part, she was now living only a mile from the King's own lodgings. It seemed that Henry was already, as he had done with Anne, treating his next wife as Queen before his previous wife was even off the scene. This also indicates not only was he sure that Jane was going to be his next Queen, but of course with the events already that the way he was going to get a new wife was that Anne was going to be condemned to death. There is a letter from Henry to Jane sometime uh, while she was installed at Chelsea, so between the 14th and the day that Anne was executed on the 19th, where he talks about um, her not paying too much attention to the criticism, effectively, that their relationship was gaining. Anne was not popular particularly in many quarters, um, especially in London, because of course her existence had precipitated the removal from public life of their queen, their first queen, Catherine of Aragon, who had been queen for over 20 years. And so, you know, there wasn't, it wasn't that there was great feeling towards Anne, but the king's actions, imprisoning his wife, imprisoning her with the threat of death over her head, even those who potentially didn't like Anne could see that this was abhorrent behaviour. However, Henry tells Jane to pay no heed to this. On the 15th of May, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V wrote to his ambassador at the English court, Eustace Shapri. In it, he says that he's heard about the allegations against Queen Anne and that the king is to take on a new wife. Now, Charles V was the nephew of Catherine of Aragon. There was no love lost between him and Anne. Not only does he accept the situation in sort of almost a gleeful manner, but that it's going to happen. Already accepted that Anne was condemned to die. And this is before the outcome of her trial. So it appears that even without modern day communications, rumours certainly can spread a long way. And in this case, rumours that turned out to be true. The 15th of May was the date for Anne's trial and it took place in the King's Hall within the Tower of London. The King's Hall uh, no longer exists, um, but it's pretty much situated where the Ravens um, now are in the tower. And if you visit the tower, you can see an artist's impression from above as to where the hall would have, would have stood. Now the jury was a different one to that which had heard the cases against the four men at Westminster Hall. This was a jury of um, the peers, earls, dukes of the realm, um, because Anne of course was queen. Anne wore a black velvet gown with a scarlet damask petticoat and a cap decorated with a black and white feather. She was accused of incest, adultery, and for plotting the king's death. Anne put in her plea of not guilty. The jury returned a verdict of guilty. Her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, read out the sentence with tears rolling down his face. The man who had once been in love with Anne, Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland, 
collapsed and had to be taken from the hall, but Anne remained composed. That's the cat. Shh. Anne's response to the court was eloquent. She talked of the fact that she wasn't guilty, but that there must be reason why she had been found guilty that hadn't been disclosed in court. She admitted to being jealous of the king's attentions to someone else and that that was the extent of her crimes against the king. Anne's sentence, read out by her uncle the Duke of Norfolk, condemned her to death by being burnt at the stake within the Tower of London or her head smitten off, whichever the king chose. After Anne, it was the turn of her brother George. Anne had been taken back to her apartments within the Tower of London and George brought into the King's Hall to stand in front of the same jury which had just condemned his sister. George put in his plea of not guilty and again, like his sister, was eloquent and could answer to the charges against him. George answered for himself so well that some observers thought that perhaps he would be acquitted. He was handed a note and this is where we get some of the evidence that potentially Henry was having some problems in the bedroom. George was told not to read it aloud, but he did. Possibly he knew his fate was sealed, so what had he got to lose? And this note referred to an allegation that he had um, talked about the King's impotency, which had apparently been reported from the Queen to his wife, the uh, Queen's lady-in-waiting. So George did read this out at court. Now the charge basically was that he had talked um, and joked about the king's lack of sexual prowess. This is important because the king is the one that sires the heirs and so if he can't perform in, in bed it's, it's an important issue. And that he joked about that potentially then Elizabeth wasn't his daughter. Now that was treason in a way because he was talking about the legitimacy of the king's children. The fact that George had then read out the note regarding this uh, allegation in court when he had been expressly asked not to or told not to do so meant he'd embarrassed the king in public and the jury, already not enamoured with him, were going to be turned against him even more. The jury returned a unanimous verdict of guilty and again their uncle the Duke of Norfolk read out the sentence. Now for George this was the full sentence for high treason of being hung, drawn and quartered at Tyburn. George's reaction to his sentence was recorded by Ambassador Shapri and in his report of it he talks about George after being condemned to die said that since I shall die I will no longer keep up the pretense of innocence and that has been um, taken to mean by some that he was admitting to incest with his sister the Queen. Um, however, Claire Ridgway argues in her book um, about the fall of Anne Boleyn, a countdown, that actually many people who were condemned to die for a, uh, a crime that they didn't commit still saw it as they deserved to die because this must be God's will. They had a strong belief in original sin. So not that he was admitting to, um, to the charges which had been put against him, but that he was a, admitting to being a sinner. On the 16th of May, the day that Henry was signing the death warrants of his wife and the men who were being condemned alongside her, Archbishop Cranmer visited Anne at the Tower of London, ostensibly giving her the spiritual comfort that she had been requesting for days by this point. But Cranmer had another duty while he was there, the more important one, as far as Henry was concerned, of getting Anne to admit to an impediment to their marriage, that there was a pre-contract before her marriage um, to Henry to someone else. Now, this meant that the marriage to Anne could be annulled. It meant that Elizabeth would be illegitimate. But Anne spoke of having hope that she would go to a nunnery and it's perhaps a promise that Cranmer gave her that she would be able to go to a nunnery should she uh, admit to this impediment which would make the annulment of her marriage to Henry oh much, so much easier. However, as we know, 
and didn't go to a nunnery, perhaps this was when her sentence was commuted from being burnt alive to having her head chopped off. And obviously we know that this was done by a sword, not an ax, a much quicker way of being killed. On the 17th of May, the five condemned men were taken to Tower Hill to be beheaded. Their sentences commuted from the full traitor's death of being hung, drawn and quartered to that of being beheaded. The five men were Sir Henry Norris, Mark Smeaton, Sir Francis Weston, Sir William Brereton and George Boleyn. The men were executed in order of rank, so George Boleyn was the first to be executed and Mark Smeaton, after seeing four men beheaded in front of him, was the final one. George's head and body was taken inside the chapel of St Peter Ad Vincula, inside the Tower of London, where it was buried at the high altar. The other four men were buried in the churchyard of St Peter Ad Vincula. Now obviously Anne would have been aware that the men were being executed on this day. As to whether she was a witness, uh, it's difficult to say where her apartments uh, were located in the Tower of London. There isn't line of sight up to Tower Hill. Um, but potentially Gareth Russell has argued that she could have asked to be moved to one of the other towers, uh, either the Byward Tower or the Bell Tower, um, in which case she possibly would have had a long but a view of, of, of Tower Hill. On the same day the men were executed, Anne's marriage to Henry was annulled. Now an annulment effectively means that the marriage had never legally existed. This left the king free to marry again. Next week we'll continue with the final couple of days in Anne's story, what the reaction was to her death and the aftermath of her death. So join me next week for that. Thank you so much for watching this episode. If you enjoyed it, please do give it the thumbs up. And if you want to comment, please do, because I will reply to your comments. Um, if you're not subscribed, quite a few of you watch but aren't subscribed, please do subscribe. There's a button here. Obviously, you can go onto the page and, and click that as well. And there's the bell, of course. We need you to click the bell and then you will get notifications when there is a new episode. They go live every Sunday, but in the meantime, I also do some bonus videos. There's some virtual tours and some talks and all sorts of things. But for now, stay safe, stay well, and I'll see you again next time.